Merci Lisa. Euh, bonjour, euh, bonne soirée à, à tous et à toutes. Euh, C'est un énorme plaisir d'être ici euh, avec vous euh, au Québec spécialement et au sein de cette conférence qui, est, qui a déjà fait partie de, de notre, notre histoire. Il y a longtemps qu'on participe de, de, de ces genres de réunions. Et là, on a évolué, je crois, d'une façon euh, très positive. Et il me donne un énorme plaisir, plaisir d'y être ici euh, aujourd'hui, je crois. Je um, do make some points today about uh, why is it that we should be um, now more than ever uh, concerned with, with health impact assessment and health and health policies. I think there's a number of uh, international, there's a jeu international, the international conditions which uh, I think point us today to, in that direction. Our reason, in some of our experience in WHO and what we've been doing recently and how we have been using HIA in a pretty, uh, let's say, free form yeah, as a, a framework for uh, doing health and health policies. Um, and then I'll come up with some proposals because I'm getting patient and I'm getting old probably. And we've been meeting for many years, and I think it's time that we do some strategic thinking together. So what I use the opportunity is to um, go in that direction and make some, um, you know, provocation, to be an agent provocateur ce soir, uh, pour voir où est-ce qu'on arrive, où est-ce que nous, nous, nous mène. Uh, donc, um, c'est spécialement un plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui uh, pour plusieurs raisons. D'abord, ça passe cette conférence euh, annuelle, on était clé pour établir une communauté mondiale des pratiquants de l'évaluation d'impact de la santé et un groupe d'intérêt très important. Ces réunions régulières nous permettent de partager des idées, des questions, des innovations, d'identifier les progrès et de servir en tant qu'un bilan concernant ces sujets. D'autres rencontres sont régionales, euh, comme le, le, le rencontre à l'Asie Pacifique ou les Amériques récemment qui, a, qui ont commencé. Et on a aussi les, les rencontres de l'AIE, de, de l'Association internationale d'impact de la santé, qui c'est plutôt une occasion de faire les liens entre, euh, avec les, 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 les collègues qui euh, mènent d'autres impacts, euh, des relations d'impact, soit environnementales, sociaux, etc. So, c'est une, une occasion très unique. Mais cette conférence ici sert, je crois, au groupes qui travaillent plutôt avec l'impact de santé, de réfléchir. De réfléchir et voir comment est-ce qu'on euh, euh, mène des, des innovations et des, comment est-ce qu'on peut adresser les, 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 disons, les limitations qu'on a euh, jusqu'au moment. Euh, et troisièmement, parce que nous sommes au Québec et au Canada, et je ne peux pas m'empêcher de penser que qu l'évaluation d'impact de santé rentre chez elle car nous sommes accueillis par des gens qui ont fait des contributions fondamentaux sur les conseils de la, à la pratique, sur les conseils et la pratique de l'IAS, et la santé de toutes les politiques, et aussi à l'action multisectorielle de la santé. Donc c'est un grand plaisir d'être au Canada et d'être au Québec, spécialement à, pour cette raison. C'est un effet propice d'avoir cette réflexion sur ces orientations actuelles de l'évaluation de la santé, et comme, euh, comment répondre à un nouveau défi des opportunités, ici, dans la ville, cette ville historique, qui a été berceau d'innovation dans les politiques de santé et dans l'esprit libre de ses habitants. Euh, propice et opportun, parce que c'est un moment crucial pour l'avaluation des parts de la santé et pour la santé dans toutes les politiques. Euh, première, pour plusieurs raisons, euh, premièrement, parce que nous sommes confrontés dans une crise économique presque mondiale, euh, où un grand nombre de pays doit faire plus avec ayant euh, moins. Pour resserrer les budgets et réduire les ressources et matières de santé, tout en ayant besoin, plus que jamais, de protéger et promouvoir la santé de la population. Les, les dépenses sociales sont limités en faveur des zones qui sont considérées comme favorisant directement la reprise économique et l'évaluation de la santé et les politiques euh, publiques saines permettront que les coûts de la protection de la santé soient remboursés par ces euh, investissements. Deuxièmement, 
en raison des fardeaux sans précédent de la maladie et des coûts que la société supporte par rapport à la maladie non transmissible internationalement. Euh, la réunion du haut niveau de l'Assemblée mondiale, euh, de l'Assemblée des Nations Unies de l'année passée, a été la deuxième euh, fois dans l'histoire où la santé a été traitée. La première fois, c'était avec le HIV et le SIDA dans les années 90, et, et c'est la deuxième fois. On a, dans le moment, plus de 36 millions de, de personnes qui décèdent chaque année à des maladies non transmissibles, avec un coût énorme pour la population, qui est estimé par la Banque mondiale et par l'OMS à, à l'ordre des trillions de, de, de dollars, des milliards de dollars. Euh, les maladies non transmissibles, je crois, affirmement, et aussi l'Assemblée des Nations Unies euh, écrit ça, que le, ça, c'est, de, les maladies peuvent être résoudre, ou résolues grâce à l'augmentation substantielle de la santé dans toutes les politiques. Et ça a été indiqué clairement dans la euh, déclaration. Ça, c'est sur le numéro qui, qui vous voyez euh, par rapport à les mortalités totales dans le monde euh, chaque année. Et la proportion, c'est deux tiers de, de, de ces mortalités, même en pays de développement, même en Afrique sous-saharienne, il est en grande proportion, presque 50%, qui est causé par les maladies non transmissibles. Donc, c'est un grand... Uh, raison pour travailler sur les, les, les évaluations d'impact et sur les politiques publiques saines. Parce que le système de santé n'aura jamais les conditions de traiter médicament uh, toutes ces, ces maladies. Euh, troisièmement aussi, parce que la, la conférence des Rio de l'année passée sur les déterminants sociaux de la santé a proposé l'évaluation d'un pas et les, les politiques publiques saines comme un des, des, des grandes stratégies de, de travail. Et quatrièmement, euh, parce que euh, dans le sommet des Rio, pour le développement durable, au mois de juin passé, euh, on a euh, aussi... Euh, identifier que ça, c'est en façon pour l'OMS, euh, à identifier que c'est la façon de euh, créer nombreux, nombreux euh, opportunités dans la santé publique. Et nous avons eu une euh, expérience assez particulière avec ça que je vais vous raconter euh, tout de suite. Euh, je voudrais falloir euh, valoir que l'évaluation d'un pas offre les cadres appropriés pour la création des indicateurs de santé, pour les politiques de développement durable, ça veut dire pour Rio plus vente, etc., pour identifier et appliquer les politiques intersectorielles qui empêchent les maladies non transmissibles, et pour utiliser des ressources d'autres secteurs pour assurer la protection de la santé euh, avec l'ensemble des ressources et contribuer à faire face à la crise économique. Ce sont des opinions très spécifiques et très fortes. Euh, et je voudrais vous donner quelques exemples, et quelques expériences de l'OMS, de pourquoi est-ce que je crois ça et où est, d'où est-ce que j'en trouve ces, ces, ces convi- mes convictions. Euh, je voudrais vous parler de ce que je, pas, je, j'appelle un peu librement comme les, les évaluations d'impact des, des stratégique. C'est comment est-ce qu'on peut utiliser le, l'évaluation d'impact comme un, un cadre d'évaluation. De, en façon de travailler sur les impacts euh, sur la santé des, des autres secteurs, euh, en donnant quelques expériences spécifiques. Euh, je passe l'anglais maintenant et je euh, bon, so, so I'm I'm going to talk of what we are calling very uh, loosely um, a strategic application of of health impact assessment. I will give you some examples. Uh, the first is an example with the development banks. Some of you uh, work with them. Uh, they have created a few years ago a requirement among their several requirements for uh, impact assessments, uh, like for gender or for environment or for uh, indigenous people. They created one requirement. They used to have one for occupational health and safety, but they created one for community health. And, um, à partir de ça, on a commencé à travailler plus prochement avec la, plus proche avec la, les, les banques de développement pour essayer de les aider un peu parce qu'ils avaient un, un biais un peu euh, trop euh, l'évaluation environnementale de santé. 
et les, il y avait une certaine limitation de, 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 de type de numéro, de nombre de, 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 de pas ou de, de, de déterminants de la santé qu'il choisissait de, de travailler et qui c'était le socio était souvent euh, exclu. Um, so what we have been doing is to look at some of the case studies that the banks had, and we work with them in some of those case studies, and identify what were the reasons for them to do that. Some of them are business reasons. They, they mostly are there doing the evaluation, uh, the impact value, the evaluation, the, the health impact, uh, the, the as impact assessments, as ways to manage risks. And health is one of the ways that risks can, can, can be presented. So that's the reason why we're doing this. But apart from managing risks, uh, we see that there's uh, a number of other advantages of working with banks. Uh, and that's why we call it, it's strategic to work with banks. Because they set a standard for the industry and for the countries often. They um, enhance public participation because they're creating and uh, enabling access to information about uh, health impacts. They um, require uh, information disclosure. And that is uh, something very positive from the point of view that if we don't have disclosure, if people are doing their health impact assessment in the private sector, but don't disclose what the results are, we, you don't really, I mean, you're protecting the industry, but you're not necessarily um, protecting the population or, or enhancing public health. Uh, and it can also uh, produce access to grievance mechanisms, which again is very positive. So we draw, draw some of those lessons. We're still participating in the collective group of banks and um, um, the development partners under the OECD that are interested in this kind of impact assessments, including the banks. And we produce a little guide that draws some of, of, of those lessons as a way of putting it forward. A, a further example, which has been, I think, very interesting for us, is for the last few years to work with some of the extractive industry uh, experiences. And um, as you know, the extractive industry offers a number of opportunities which are often uh, not necessarily the people from the, from the countries who have the resources benefit, the resource curse. Um, there's a number of reasons why health impacts occur in that, in that uh, context. Uh, flux, uh, influx of large uh, number of single men with money who come and are, are doing the work, sex workers, food, you know, services that follow, uh, a number of risks which are often uh, not anticipated by the people who are uh, hosting the project and hoping to gain development and resources for the population. Now, so that mismatch between expectations and what's actually happen on, happening on the ground, I think is something very dramatic, especially because the countries which have the resources, now Canada is an exception, so is Australia, but a lot of the, the other countries who have natural resources are very poor. So the question is coming also from some of these countries about what can you do about it? And one thing in what the industry, actually the oil and extractive industry has been very positive, they even created guidance on that. Uh, IPICA has been proactive and, and there's, uh, the private sector has been quite active on that. Now what we have observed is that is the value of having a bird's eye view of what are the overall issues, because it, it's a complex industry. You have uh, extraction, but you have transport, you have pipelines, you have refineries. There's a number of processes which are happening at the same time. And if you're uh, examining one of each in each project at a time, you don't have a, an idea about the, the complex interactions and the added, uh, the summed up um, uh, list of impacts. And the uh, health systems uh, specifically suffer a lot because they are often unable to plan for the range of changes which happen in, in this kind of context. So um, what we ended up doing is some model of how can we work strategically with the government, with the industry, and the government in the health sector, but also the EIA people, because they are involved in that, the Ministry of Natural Resources or Energy, uh, which is often the case, and to come up with some plan, some grand plan that can foresee and have some, uh, an overall strategy for the health system to adapt and for the industry to adapt and for the departments as well. We have some experience which uh, 
it's, it's very encouraging. I mean, although it's been applied in, in a few places, we have uh, quite a, a bit of confidence in uh, the uh, opportunities that this uh, has been creating, um, especially for having this strategic vision for the health sector and for the other sectors to be able to engage in a more uh, productive partnership. Um, again, this experience is reflected uh, in a little guide, which, is, um, which a number of people here who have experience in the extractive industry also, also contributed. And when I say WHO is just the part of the world and the part of the knowledge that I have contact with, because I cannot pretend to know uh, everybody's experience. But um, whatever I say WHO is WHO with partners, and we're mostly a, a convener rather than, rather than a... Uh, the other experience, and I'm, I'm give a, a couple of others still, is what happened earlier this year in that the Rio Plus 20 conference first document, which came up in January 2012, had no, not the word health in it. It was completely absent. We were a bit shocked in that picture because we had submitted uh, documentation and, and inputs and um, none of what we've done and our partners and people we knew had, had done had, had any, any impact. And possibly the people who were in, sitting in the UN or in doing this draft were a bit fed up with health. You know, maybe the MDGs have too many health issues in it or too many diseases. Um, so we were a bit taken aback by that. Um, the proposal for a discussion in Rio had uh, seven actions and they, they were in energy, um, agriculture, and food, uh, cities, jobs, uh, oceans. Um, there's one or two that I'm missing, energy. Um, and so what we decided to do was, well, let's think in health impact assessment, health in our policy terms, and see what the policies they are proposing as sustainable for discussion in Rio, what's in the discourse of the people who are going to Rio. And let's create some uh, indicators work or some response that can talk about what are the health issues in the kinds of proposals that they are having. So we have quickly, again, uh, fortunately, we have the, the, the partnerships that, uh, the, of the public health community internationally. We, we did a consultation. We came up with uh, some proposals which were very succinct about what the health issues were. And we teamed up with civil society, a number of civil society groups, in disseminating this. The end result is very positive, is that there is a whole chapter on health. You know, it's not perfect, but it talks about health in our policies, and it talks about uh, even health impact assessment and, um, uh, as a way of getting there. So um, it was a way of using this understanding of health in our policies and HIA as a way of um, documenting that and organizing our, our thoughts and our knowledge that we had. Sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, one other example is what the, the great debate on climate change. Uh, the IPCC has been giving the world the wisdom and the truth about what should be done for mitigation of climate change. Now, they acknowledge that they don't do any co-benefits analysis or they don't look at other issues which are not what's written in the Kyoto Protocol, that is CO2. So we thought it was opportune uh, to take a look at that, uh, again from a health in our policies, health impact assessment, broad methodology. And what we've done was to take five of the sector recommendations from uh, transportation, agriculture, uh, construction, um, trans transport energy, energy um, and then we constructed one for the health sector uh, out of transport and construction. And we, we did an analysis and come up with some quite surprising uh, and useful, I think, uh, findings. For example, in transport, they didn't see, they focused only on the technologies. And they were proposing technologies which even are bad for health, such as use of diesel vehicles, which we know produce more you know, particles and, and they create respiratory and heart disease. But that was in, in the list of best options. Whilst the more integrated strategies for sustainable transport, cycling, walking, public transport, etc., were not there. Although they do have a big impact on CO2 reductions, and they do have a number of other co-benefits. Um, so we thought it was curious and it was worthwhile pointing out for the IPCC, first of all, because they're going to have a, a next 
uh, a set of assessments issued uh, next year is expected. Um, but also to other people who are doing uh, decisions on that. And we've been communicating, especially in the Conference on Climate Change. Same thing with energy. They forgot the energy of the two billion households in the world which use solid fuel and who uh, produce indoor air pollution in, you know, there's a couple of million deaths which happen in poor children and, and women. Um, half of all the pneumonias are caused by uh, indoor air pollution for those causes. And that was not part of one of, although it does have reduction of short and long term uh, greenhouse gases, it was not there. Um, so we thought it was useful also to, to point that out. Similarly, in other, in the housing and construction strategies, there was no mention of slums in developing countries. Now that's a third of the population in developing countries, 30-35% of large cities, uh, most large cities have uh, slums. And there are a number of very good um, experiments with uh, addressing the uh, climate change issues, reducing greenhouse gases in, in, in ways that are, for example, that include natural ventilation rather than air conditioning, which is something which is uh, recommended as an adapt adapt adaptation strategy, which I think is really distressing that we won't uh, recommend air conditioning as an adaptation strategy when you know that you're uh, creating uh, more of a cycle of. Uh, so having those insights was very useful for WHO and the health community to be able to position itself in that debate on climate change. What do you do and where are the, the, the best policies to, to, to address those? Um, this has implications of even for funding for the health sector because at the moment that we have uh, those kinds of issues that co-benefits recognize as part of the equation in climate decisions. That also may mean that we will have uh, documentation uh, and we will have uh, potential finance coming into that. The last example that I'll use is an old example, and some of you uh, may have heard before, is the example of working with environment impact assessments and strategic impact assessments. And I'll go back to that because I think Although we have this historical parallel tracks of people working with environment, health, health and environment assessments and health impact assessments as not making much of a connection. And I mean, over time, we in WHO certainly have merged very much the, the two tracks. I do think that there's still some hesitation in uh, making use of what's out there. And EIAs are out there in the legislation of most countries of the world. And I may say it's perhaps not perfect, but it has helped include environment conditions and concerns in the minds of whoever does any investment anywhere in the world. And I see that everywhere I go. So I know it's not perfect, but it is there. And we are at the moment very far from being there. Health in our policies is not in the public debate, is not in the public domain, and we're not making the noise or we're not having the recognition or giving people the opportunity to understand what are the issues that are there in those uh, investment decisions and that they're not grasping uh, at that point in time. So I'd say that uh, one of the ways, one of the, one of the things that we could do uh, and we should be doing is to use better those opportunities. And I found these slides are from uh, 2001. Uh, and they are part of when we were making the argumentation for the strategic environment assessment to include health. I'll go very shortly on this, I don't want to bore you, but the end result of our effort, which was three years of you know, sitting in tables and negotiating around that, those tables, with a group of 12 ministers of health, with a group of another 35, I think, ministers of environment, uh, was that there's requirements for health to be part in everywhere in the strategic environment assessment. Health authorities have to be there. It's part, it has to be part of the screening, the scoping, the environment and health report, uh, you know, monitoring everything. So, and I don't think, and Julia Novaki is, is here, so she might have some more updated, but uh, there is an evaluation being done of the implementation. The protocol in, went into force in 2010. Uh, they are now doing an evaluation on how, how this implementation has gone. But I'm, I, would be, I would bet that 
the, I don't even know if the health authorities are going to be consulted. I hope they are in this evaluation. Uh, and if they're not, we should be doing that part. Because uh, there's an opportunity that we shouldn't be missing. We shouldn't let people invest enormously at the national level in having legislation trying to implement it. And when we have the opportunity to put health and not putting, I think that's omission. And I think we should be very uh, considerate of, of, of those. Um, this is just an attempt, like, I was trying to get a picture of uh, how long have we been meeting, and it's been very long. But that's uh, Alex Scott Samuel, I think is Martin Burley, and a few others, uh, Debbie Abrahams, um, many years ago. They all look much younger and, and fresher. But it's just to say that we have been meeting at round tables on, on this issue. And I, this is, I'm not going to read that for you. It's just a list of the number of events which happen on the side of health impact assessment, on the side of environmental health impact assessment or environmental impact assessment over the years. And there's directives, there's law, there's conferences. Uh, there's a lot. Um, I won't bore you with the detail, but it's just to say that what I, my main message today is that I think we've had a lot of discussions. We're, I think we're have gone in depth into methodology debates and implementation and experience, which is very important. I would like to propose that we think at this moment here in Quebec about implementation. I think Quebec is the right place for that because you probably have, in terms of institutionalization, some of the best experience along with Thailand, along with some other countries. But um, it's, it's the right time of, for me at least, and I'd like to propose that, to think of how is that, can we set a plan for us, in five years when we meet, uh, which makes it 2017, um, to know, you know where, what we would have achieved and what we want to achieve in five years. And I think as a loose community, which has governments, uh, experts, international agencies, and that could be free to think, it is free to think and to propose and to articulate, I'd like to propose that we do spend some time on this. And I have some uh, snippets of, um, let's say, opinions to, to give and suggestions or for where we might be, what we could be doing. What would be a basic package that we would like to see that every country should have and the international agencies should uh, engage with and experts should contribute to? And I would say one is the business of uh, wide dissemination of information about health and health policies, and about, about what are the health implications. I don't think this is at all in the uh, public domain, and I think that's one of the challenges that we have to make that much more widely known. How we get there is a different story, but I mean, I think that would be one of the uh, objectives. The other is to have a, a tracking system to know what's happening with sector policies. If not with all sector policies, with some, with a few, with the main ones in your city or in your region or in your country. We don't have, we have a system to track health and health risks, but we don't link them to what the policies that are causing those. So I think a tracking system that talks to uh, the oranges or the sources of disease would be some of the, the things that could make, could be a game changer. And the third one is just to use the opportunities which are out there, including AIA, SEA, et cetera, user. Thank you. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, support for that. Um, some ideas of how to get there. Um, I think from experience, from your experience, centers of expertise, of advice, technical support and research have shown, I think, to have a, a, a very positive impact and they're very important. Um, two is to have requirements for health impacts. Because if there's no requirements written in some law, in some red, red, it changes the government, it changes the you know, the political view of the, and we've seen this in British Columbia. I think we've seen that in Britain, perhaps, at the moment. So it, those things come and go if there's no uh, structure to, and, and I think that's one thing that we should be thinking, what are those structures? The third point is to talk very um, clearly with the health sector. We, many of us are part of the health sector, and it should be part of healthcare reform, when we talk about universal access to, um, to health coverage, uh, we should be including health and health policies and in, in health impact assessment as a tool for that. Uh, and third is to use opportunities. Taranto in the south of Italy today 
has this debate where a judge decided to close an industry which employs 12,000 people because there's an excess of, excess of cancer. So it's, it's in the public debate. We should use those opportunities which are, you know, she made a decision as a judge that it was unacceptable. So her solution was, let's close the factory. Now, she's not pondering the fact that there's other health impacts in closing the factory. And what other solutions could there be, you know, for the, the kind of issue that, that, that is happening in Taranto? But I think using the, those kinds of opportunities, be legal, be media, uh, in a clever way, are also part of what we should be doing and uh, ways of engaging. I think WHO has some role to play in knowledge base. We're pretty good at having all sorts of rules and you know, grading and system of putting the evidence, etc. cetera, um, about communication as well, partnerships with other agencies, I'd say, uh, and perhaps having a global tracking system. Private sector has not only to commission EIAs or HIAs uh, or health in EIAs, but also have to provide access. And a lot of the issues with the private sector have been the lack of access to what, what's been done. And to commit with engage with, with those issues. Civil society, have a, civil society has a very high and large role to play, including on professional organizations. Among them, partnerships such as, the, such as through the IAIA, but also dissemination information advocacy very clearly and providing voice to different groups, which I think nobody else can do as well as, as, as a civil society. Um, and this conference, I hope, would provide a roadmap, a strategy for achieve, achieving an increased implementation of HIA in health and health policies, uh, as I was saying before. And how, and these are my last two slides, how we would measure success, success or how would I measure success? I would say in terms of process and in terms of outcomes. In terms of process, I think I'd measure, do we have in five years widespread understanding of health risks and benefits of sector policies? Is that part of common conversation or common understanding of journalists and, and judges and, and other people? Do we have a stronger knowledge base and expertise and more expertise in HIA health and all policies? Do we have a functioning global tracking system for that, for the policies and the health impacts? Do we have substantial health inputs for EIAs and SCAs? And do we have working partnerships with some other sectors? And those are six points or five, five points. And in outcomes, I'm putting three. Have we achieved in five years um, through HIA and uh, health and all policies have we included that in sustainable development decisions? Are they a part of the indicators? Do, have we, are they named in, in those uh, strategies? Have we managed to prevent NCDs, and including the prevention of NCDs, health and health policies in HIA? And have we managed to include in health reform and in universal access, which is the new jargon which is coming up, and which is probably going to be a sustainable development goal, uh, have we managed to put health and health policies there? Um, je voudrais euh, finir pour conclure, euh, proposer qu'ils utilisent cette conférence comme un point de réflexion, comme j'ai dit, pour approfondir une feuille de route qui peut ouvrir vos voies et créer conditions favorables et nécessaires à l'évaluation de par la santé et la politique publique saine, afin d'atteindre son plein potentiel et réaliser des gains pour la santé euh, qui nous trouvons possibles. Um, si vous me demandez, je voudrais voir un manifeste de Québec uh, qui sort de cette réunion pour une large mise en œuvre d'évaluation d'impact de la santé. Et j'aimerais bien quitter cette réunion avec un, un plan clair sur la façon dont nous voulons voir un changement de l'avenir immédiat et plus longtemps. Nous avons ici certains des meilleurs serveux qui ont travaillé sur ces questions. Allons-y Préparons-nous pour le travail. Je, je voudrais remercier le Québec d'avoir accueilli cette réunion et pour cette occasion unique. Merci.